Bismillah. So it's such an honor to be with you tonight, Ustada Jose, and um, to be with whoever is watching us. Alhamdulillah, welcome. welcome. And uh, we just um, we just had this conversation, right, about you know this this little meeting of ours here online um, and this um, discussion that we're about to have <clears throat> came out of a in really interesting conversation that that um, you and I and some other um, teachers were having uh, just about a, a topic that was of great concern. And um, so, yeah, maybe you want to announce a little bit more about that. And Sure. Um, yes, we were, we're on a thread, right? We're on a thread together, alhamdulillah, as you said, with uh, several other teachers. And I believe one of the other teachers mentioned something regarding TikTok, which as maybe some of you who are watching know about, maybe some of you don't, but just a little bit of background. TikTok is an app, uh, like many of the popular social media apps that has really kind of taken flight uh, for the past, I would say, maybe a couple of years I think it originated in China, I want to say. It's a Chinese app that was then brought over to the U.S. and it became very, very popular as a platform primarily for performers, for skits, entertaining sort of, you know, it has an entertainment value for people to showcase maybe their dance skills, their um, singing skills, uh, their acting skills. So it became, I think initially that was its great pull is that a lot of people were just interested in watching um, you know, complete strangers from all parts of the world uh, showcase their 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 unique talents. Yeah. Um, and I I had always know, heard of it, you know, in the past, you know, a year or two maybe as an app, but I never understood what it really was until very recently. I would say I think it was the beginning of the year. I, I do um, programs with teens, and uh, you know, their their coming of age talks and. I try to really reach, you know, reach uh, across the generational divide and, and make a connection with them. So I allow them to open up about things that are going on in their lives. What, you know, what are they watching in terms of television, in terms of film, what songs are they listening to? And of course, social media comes up. And so I like to, you know, get a pulse on what's going on because it's constantly evolving. There was a time where Snapchat was the popular app right? And then people left Snapchat all of a sudden, there's like an exodus, mass exodus. And then it was, uh, you know, Instagram, everybody suddenly jumped on Instagram. And then I saw also that there was the switch, you know, we know that teens for the most part, I think they don't even come close to Facebook. It's like the older people's app. Uh, but these other more visually based apps were popular for a while. But as I noticed, it, I feel like teens are kind of also leaving um, Instagram. So this is where my inquiry query began. And I asked like, what's, what are the popular apps now? And this is when a group of teens um, told me that the most popular app is probably TikTok amongst their, their demographic. And again, I had, I knew of TikTok, but I just never ever bothered to download it or really explore what it was. So after one of the teens admitted to me that it's so highly addictive, she was just kind of being herself and being honest and said to me, that she one time was so um, just enthralled by it, or, you know, captivated by everything that was going on. She ended up spending four hours on it in, in like one setting. Yeah. And she realized, wow, it's just so addictive. Like she can't almost pull herself away. Mm -hmm. That statement is what compelled me to say, okay, I need to know what's going on. So I downloaded the app. And instantly, I just remember that as soon as I got on, they, they, in the, the first, you know, in the sign up um, uh, process, they ask you, you know, to pick your interests. And there's a, you know, menu of different things that you might want to see, right? So I, I kept it very minimal. I think I picked two things because I just didn't want to be bombarded. Um, uh, and so I was like, let's see what comes up. But it's to curate, you know, the content for you. Yeah. So, as uh, you move, and it's a very quick sign-up process, by the way, they're not really asking a lot of information, but wow. as soon as I uh, started the app, I was like, oh my God. And I could see that the interface uh, was designed in a way that was quite, I mean, you know, genius, I guess you could say from an app, you know, perspective or, you know, a, a creator's perspective, a developer, excuse me, perspective, because it's so easy to use. All you have to do basically, literally is swipe, you know, kind of like the Tinder format, you know, where you're, it's like a dating app, right? Minder to Tinder, there's all these 
ones, but it's like, yeah, I'm not interested. I can just move on from this person and then find something that interests me. So it's the same exact thing. Um, and, but it moves very quickly. So I found myself as I'm (laughs) first experience ever going, okay, whoa, whoa. And I spent, you know, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes plus just trying to get a grasp of what it was. And then it started to sink in like, oh my gosh, because the content initially started pretty, you know, innocent, a lot of dancing and singing, but weaved between all of that was, uh, some very suggestive stuff, highly graphic content, very disturbing from a Muslim's perspective. Okay. And then I just thought, oh my God, are, I can't believe teens are exposed to this. Like Muslim mm-hmm. teens, especially, you know, do parents know what's going on? Yeah. But I took a break, um, but I, I, I gave myself a little bit of time because I didn't want to, you know, make this sort of a definitive declaration about it without being somewhat fair. So I said, let me just go back to it maybe the next day or whenever it was, and I'll just see what else I see. During that, I would say, you know, research phase, I guess, um, I, I just was like, oh, I'll live it out. This is, this is very, very toxic. And I, I just was like, parents should absolutely not have their kids on this. This is horrible because it started, the content started getting worse and worse. And I don't know if that was an algorithm feature where, you know, they're looking at what videos I'm maybe spending a little bit too much time on. I don't know. I, but I just realized like, why did we go from singing and dancing to now an overwhelming amount of, um, you know, uh, just very inappropriate graphics sort of sexually, you know, a lot of over, I I can't even explain it, but like couples, uh, oftentimes many of them were gay, you know, men and women, Mm -hmm. Um, doing things inappropriately, making jokes, but it was just like so much of that. And I thought if you have a 12 or a 13 year old, which some of these kids were on this app, even if they're watching their friends and private accounts, this feature allows them to watch anybody because some of the videos were, you know, from very popular people, uh, celebrities, others were unknown people, but it was a very, it was like a hodgepodge. How can you control what's coming to you? I couldn't control it. And so it disturbed me on a very deep level. I wrote a post on it on Facebook and that post, alhamdulillah, went, I guess, a bit viral, they say, (laughs) Um, in the sense that moms were, I think, uh, who didn't know and parents who didn't know started cutting and pasting and kind of putting out a warning to their friends. And then the, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of giving a very long answer, but it, it gives you the background of how this all came about. The final um, sort of, um, you know, culmination of all that was that, one mom uh, shared it on a WhatsApp page or thread. And then that, and then her daughter who is on TikTok, she came on to kind of vent that my mom really wants me and my younger brother to get off of TikTok and look, and then she posts in the background, my post (laughs) um, uh, saying that, you know, this Muslim lady, thank God my name wasn't on that. Right. This Muslim lady um, is telling everybody to get their kids off of TikTok. And so she was lamenting, but she was much, she had good adib about it. uh, So that was relieving. But I think, you know, that was where the conversation took place on the thread is that I, I referenced that incident yeah. happening and then just gave more of a warning about the dangers of this app that I, I believe um, m- parents are really not very well uh, informed about, but also the teens themselves uh, may not quite understand why this content or this, uh, you know, outpouring sort of bombardment in terms of, the, you know, what the content is. Is, is, is quite actually detrimental to them spiritually. So that's why you were so gracious to, um, to respond to that, uh, you know, on that thread. And then here we are, right? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's, it's really good. I mean, I'm so, I'm so happy that you, I mean, you obviously you really care a lot about the people who you're working with. And subhanAllah, just the whole background of how you, how you know knowing that someone could spend four hours on something like this just how that struck your heart i mean that's just that just gives me shivers because you know really literally i have goosebumps um because that's what we need we need we really need people like you who care and who will say okay fine you're you're in this swamp and i'm coming in to get you like because then you went and signed up for this thing to figure out like what is this that's taking 
mm-hmm. that would that would suck someone in uh, for four whole hours. I need to know. I need to you know figure it out so that I can help people. And then you wrote that beautiful post, and I'm saying beautiful. Yeah, it was it's full of warnings, um, but beautiful because again, it's an expression of care. And mm-hmm. I think you know. I mean, I'm I didn't really know what TikTok is. Like I didn't know until you explained it, mm-hmm. <laughs> which. You know, it shows that I'm just not in that world. And um, but I also have seen it appearing a lot on like TikTok videos appearing on Instagram. So it, it's, it was clear that it was getting quite popular if it and I saw people who I know, like who I follow on Instagram. They might be professionals in different fields, doctors and people like that saying, oh, I'm on TikTok now. And then you would start to see videos with mm-hmm. with, with music and with a very particular format. So it kind of crossed over, I guess, into, into other types of social media at a certain point. But I, I think the real reason we wanted to get together and talk about this is just to talk about how you know form, formats and genres of social media or platforms, as they're called, you know, how people are using them, especially at a time like this, when we are being told to be socially distant from each other. That means we cannot... We can't go to a restaurant with our friends. We can't go to the park. In the, you know, in many cities, you can't. The parks are closed. So in my city, the parks are literally closed. Um, you know, we have neighbors who are being empowered to call a snitch line if they see people outside who they suspect are not, you know, family members. So it's a very uh, it's a, it's a time when people are choosing to stay home or they're being asked to stay home or it's the law at this point to stay home. And given that, you know, what, what happens then? What are people turning to uh, in order to pass the time and in order to have a sense of connection or community? So I'm interested in, in hearing from you. What, what are you seeing there and what are your concerns since you are kind of our expert in TikTok? <laughs> Very sweet. I am, I would hardly call myself an expert in anything, but thank you for that, um, mashallah. You know, I have seen, I think, an uptick um, in you know social media use because, as you mentioned, people are isolated. They're, you know, uh, bored, um, and that's really the essential, you know, issue here is that in the absence of something uh, productive, uh, what what do what do we do? Or how do we respond? Right? And I think a lot of times. People who are maybe not, who don't have that level of self-awareness, um, perhaps they don't realize that they're, you know, uh, that they have the, um, the propensity to just kind of fall into things that are quite dangerous only because uh, they they don't they're not doing something like I said productive right mm-hmm. so again you're spending so many hours at home where as before there were there was always something to do to keep you occupied you were in school maybe you were in a sport you know I'm spe- specifically speaking to teens right they were engaged in some activity um, that kept them away from it and between those uh, you know. Uh, activities, I'm sure they found opportunities because that's what, you know, uh, I've, I've heard anyway, uh, that there was always a way to try to get checked into your social media apps, to your text messages at school or at extracurricular activities. But it wasn't as consistent, blo- these big, large blocks of time that we're seeing now, right? Mm-hmm. From the morning, if there's no schedule or your classes may be online, if you're still doing school, which I think most people are, might be uh, reduced hours. So you're leaving a lot more time to kind of figure out what to, what to do with that time and pass that time. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the phone is so accessible. It's in our hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Wi-Fi at home. So, you know, a lot of those uh, barriers that would maybe take place in other you know, situations or locations are removed, the ease of access is so easy. And then it's just, um, it, it passes the time quickly, you know, so I do feel, unfortunately, there's been an uptick. I know myself, for example, I've never until this quarantine seen my internet uh, unstable, but I've had unstable internet quite a few times. And my assumption is, my neighbors are probably, all of us are online a lot because even the streaming services, right? Um, the Netflix and all the other film film or television streaming services take up internet. So I just feel like the dependency on these devices has increased considerably. Um, you know, and, and just to kind of give you a, a, a 
quick little uh, story to make that point. My sons, uh, I homeschool my children, and so um, we have to meet with their what we call ES or educational specialist. She's a teacher, but she checks in on their work. And so she asked about, you know, different books that my oldest uh, son was reading. And so I kind of told her that, you know, he, he's finished, uh, you know, some of the classics. And so she wanted to suggest, you know, certain literature, you know, uh, to him. But she immediately went to, oh, you know, you can, he can do it online and he can use the Kindle. And, you know, he, she started offering uh, that. And I just told her, I said, you know, I, I have a very different philosophy about uh, my, you know, reading. I want my kids to actually touch a physical book. And wow. I, 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 my kid, my, my oldest is 11. He doesn't really even know how to use a browser. Um, wow. He's, wow. he's very off the grid in terms of the internet. I do everything for them. If they need a search of something they can, you know, we have a little home pod for Apple so they can ask Siri questions, but in terms of, you know, giving a device to a child, um, I, I'm very, that's just my personal philosophy, but she was like, really? Like she was kind of surprised that I wouldn't even want them to read a book. I was like, you're asking me to give a classic, you know, something like Huckleberry Finn to my child <laughs> um, in, on a, on a online, on a device. Like, why would I do that? That's like, so anyhow, I think that's yeah. just the, the popular, you know, sentiment is that everything's online anyway, might as well, you know, read. Um, so it's, it's definitely a concern. I, I feel my, you know, I feel like we're going to pro probably have a lot of addicts uh, come out of this quarantine yeah. in terms of their social media usage. That's right. I agree with you. And I think that we can, we can broaden our discussion. I think that we can certainly come back to, to TikTok specifically um, because it has all those elements, as you mentioned, that really make it palatable to someone who, you know, a, maybe a young person who, you know, it's easy to sign up to and then it just comes at you. You know, you don't really have to go looking. Exactly. And I think that this is something we really have to emphasize because I think people don't realize that I see, for example, we have a sort of, uh, we, you know, we put out a message yesterday, sent a collective um, mm. that, you know, a lot of people, for a lot of people, um, so not yesterday, but Friday. So for a lot of people, the past Friday was the third Friday without Salat al right? Mm. For, the, for the cities that started to, I think the, the first round of closures of Jummah happened three weeks ago. And the Prophet وسلم, forbade any man from missing three Jummah prayers in a row. It's a, it's a very serious sin. No, no. And subhanAllah, I mean, it's when we, and I think it's so important to look at sin, not only in terms of the fiqh or the, okay, yes, we know that, okay, if the, if the masajid have been closed for a legitimate reason, Okay, it's not a sin in the sense that they couldn't attend; they had no choice. Right. But we're talking here about that when the Prophet Sallallahu insists on something, it's because he, there's a message behind it. There is a, there is a value. There is a nafa. There is a benefit. There is a goodness that comes from being there at Jummah. That he's telling us, you, if you miss it three times in a row, it's you're in a danger zone. Basically, absolutely. Spiritually speaking, you you've lost something that should be a fundamental part of your spiritual diet, and so that was this Friday was really critical in that sense that here we are and where are you like where are we now? So we've not had this congregational gathering with advice coming from from you know whatever the advice is. You know we know that not all khutbas, not all Friday sermons are. Brilliant, but nonetheless, there are words that are spoken in a Friday sermon that are the exact same words that the Prophet ﷺ said, and there is a blessing in that. Yeah. And that, that hasn't been spoken now in some places for three whole weeks. And so that's a 21 day thing. And then when you think about it, you know, it, many, um, you know, many people say, many uh, self help and social scientists and whoever say that it takes 21 days to form a habit. So what are the habits that we form now? Like, and what are the habits? I mean, we have to be careful that it doesn't become a habit for us to feel like, oh, I don't go to the mosque. Ya Allah. I mean, if tomorrow everything opened up, how many people would be like, I, it's very challenging for me to even go because I've just become very used to 
the way things are right now. Um, yes, maybe for the first few days, it wasn't, it, it felt odd. You felt the pain of not going to, to the prayer if you were someone who went often to the masjid. And then after that, it just becomes a new norm, as they say, right? The new norm. Right. And so that, so we put out a little message on Friday, as I said, to say, hey, and not only that, but it's, it was also 21 days till Ramadan. So here we are. It's been 21 days since quarantine started. And now we have 21 days till Ramadan. Let's make good habits going forward. And so why am I talking about all this? I think that it's, I think that a lot of people, well, some, someone commented on the little post there and it, mentioning, you know, Netflix and saying Netflix is, you know, you guys shouldn't be saying no to Netflix because mm -hmm. Netflix is a platform. Netflix is a tool. You can watch good things. You can watch bad things. And I think that's been a statement that um, Muslims have been making and it's come from Muslim scholars back in the day for a long time, right? It started with television when I was young. Mm -hmm. That was still a question. Is, is TV a bad thing? Is it okay? I remember my dad would, you know, sometimes be like, I don't know. And then that view was out there that, look, it's just a tool. If you use it for good, it's good. If you use it for bad, it's bad. It's neutral. And, um, and then, of course, when, we, when I got older, we read things like the medium is the message, that it, right. it's not just neutral. Like the way it brings, any medium also is, is teaching you to think a certain way and teaching you to interact a certain way with its content. Um, and now I think I just want to bring that up because this whole comment that Netflix is just a medium, I think, you know, kind of similar to what you were saying about TikTok. When I first watched something on Netflix, I just borrowed someone else's account. I couldn't believe how addictive it was. Right. And it wasn't because of the actual content. It, the thing I was, I was watching uh, this, uh, I watched a little bit of that show, what's it called, it's about the queen. And uh, mm -hmm. nothing special really in terms of a show, but what made it addictive is that there were no commercials. Right. There were no breaks at all. Not only that, but you could even skip the intro. So you didn't, right. there, was no, there was no way that you would pause and be like, oh, you know what, maybe, I'll, maybe I won't watch the next one. It's just a hit after hit after hit after hit. And it's, uh, I think we need to talk, uh, we need to just acknowledge that and say that, listen, it's hard when something is coming at you with that much ease, but you have to find a way to step back from that and say, what's going on for me here? You know, is this really how I want things to go? And I really understood at that point how it's possible to do a Netflix binge. SubhanAllah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with everything you said. And that's, uh, I, I mean, as, as you were speaking, I just kept thinking about, you know, um, again, this idea of, of uh, which I, I think I mentioned to you privately um, that I think people have lost uh, sort of um, maybe sight of, you know, we know from our tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us weak and that we, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, um, sort of, a, uh, what are they called? Um, we have internal and external forces that are pulling us right away from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those internal forces are, of course, our nafs, our, our, our lower sort of, you know, selves that want to indulge, want to just basically sit down and do nothing, you know, inertia, inactivity, uh, eating, sleeping, all of those appetites that uh, are, you know, very much associated with sitting and watching television or film or browsing on the internet, right, are very much a manifestation of the nafs, right, of the lower nafs basically indulging itself, because the more you do those things, the more you kind of fall into a spiritual slumber in a way, right, and this is why people, as you said, when they're binging, whether it's their phone or they're binging on Netflix, even if they're watching documentaries and everything is good, uh, the problem is that we're so forgetful, right? In San, we know this, you know, the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes uh, us with uh, comes also from the same root word as Nisyan, right? Which is to forget. We are so forgetful that when we indulge too much in our lower selves, we uh, set ourselves up to potentially, uh, you know, slip in terms of our spiritual efforts, right? So prayers are missed. We forget, oh, oops, I was supposed to, you know, call mom or 
you know, call dad or do, you know, run this errand or do my, uh, you know, recitation of the Quran for the day or whatever. All these things that we should normally have as part of our daily practice suddenly become compromised because the nafs falls into this state of just absolute, as I said, it's kind of like an intoxication. And that's how, you know, um, you know, I have two young boys, but I very early on, in, in, in explaining the human nature, introduce this world, word addiction to them because I wanted them to understand, you know, what the word addiction was and that it was something that all human beings are prone to. Because sometimes when we hear it, we think immediately of alcohol or drugs, yeah. but no, addiction is something that we, uh, every single human being can fall into if we don't learn self-regulation, yeah. right? Which is where, uh, the framework of emotional intelligence becomes incredibly useful for people because everything you you were just describing uh, is is an outline of, of of emotional intelligence. If you're the, if you're self aware and you're paying attention to your you know own tendencies, uh, then you it, it just sort of naturally develops into uh, wanting to re, you know practice restraint, right? Yeah. Um, and so you're you become aware of yourself, and then that leads that's the second quality. You know, there's five qualities of emotional intelligence, you know, according to uh, Daniel Goleman, he's the leading expert. I actually have his, his book right here. So I'm going to just That's show right. it because yeah. Yeah, people, some people, you know, they, I, I just feel like it's such a great resource, but here's the book, right? Nice. And in this book, he talks about five qualities. And so if you pay attention to the five qualities, I have always said, because I love talking about this, but I say, subhanAllah, this is Islam. He literally, I feel like he just went into our deen and said, okay, let me just cut and paste. But, um, you know, first one is self-awareness. So know your, and have knowledge of yourself. Know that you're weak in certain things and, you know, you're strong in certain things. You have talents, you have skills, but you have shahwa, you have certain things that are unique to you. Not everybody will have that, right? Mujahida, right? There's certain things. Some people struggle with their prayers. Some people struggle with fasting. Some people, you know, struggle with riba. So everybody has to know what your own internal, you know, issues are and struggles are. That's self-awareness, right? And there's so many other components of self-awareness, but just in the context of what we're talking about, you know, that's self-awareness. Self-regulation is withholding, you know, taskiyat nafs Like you need to know how to, you know, purify yourself and how to strengthen yourself so that you're not falling into these dangerous behaviors. And then uh, motivation is the third quality, empathy, and then social skills. So all of these he goes into in, in, you know, in depth, but if you just parallel them with Islam in terms of what we're taught and the example of the Prophet, it all makes sense. And I think my observation is that we have lost this mindset we've lost um this structure that our dean has given us and people forget that you know what becoming um you know uh, or or a practicing muslim is not just someone who prays five times a day and does their ritual acts they are people who are actively engaged in the process of self-purification on a daily basis yeah. right so you can't just you know, study a book or take a class on Tuskiyat and Nafs and feel like, check, I'm done. And, you know, as long as I pray and do this, I'm good. It, the process of purification is every day. And the bottom line is we sin every day and we're, we're, we falter every day and we slip every day. And so if we don't learn that that's a, such an important priority to constantly you know, practice or, or, or be in the practice of, then we set ourselves up to, like you said, um, or kind of you, you ref in a way um, you, uh, you mentioned earlier about our tendency to make excuses, right? Uh, television, Netflix, and that's again, the nafs, right? The nafs is very good at, it's like a lawyer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it knows well how to defend what it wants, right? So we justify certain things because we want it, right? It's all, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but you learn if you're paying, you know, if you're in this mindset, how to distinguish those thoughts, you know, that this is really nafs. This is my nafs wanting to indulge in this. And I, you know, have to control it because if I don't, I run the risk of, you know, majorly slipping. And then, you know, there's so many consequences, as you said, and ramifications to that. And that's where I think I, my heart breaks for the youth out there, because if we don't empower them with these toolkits and with this knowledge, yeah. Um, and, and then we we give them these devices, which I firmly believe are more dangerous than a weapon to give 
your young children a phone uh, or an iPad or anything that gives them a, a access to all of the dangerous elements of our world with the click of a button um, without giving them the toolkits to help them understand why these things are so dangerous is really um, is very dangerous and especially in the teen years right because this is where and uh, you know the medical experts know more but from what they've shared they don't have executive function you know that part of the, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed for teens so for them to actually have self-control and restraint their mujahida basically is much harder yeah. Right. Their mujahida is much harder. And so you giving a young adolescent or up to up until, you know, I think 21 is the age where late adolescence completes. And that's where that part of the brain forms completely. So look at that, that span of you know time that we're talking about, where giving them access to this information is almost like really putting them um, in the battlefield without any armor. And then we wonder why we have addictions and social anxiety disorders and all these mental health crises in that demographic. I just feel like, you know, it's all there, you know, so. That's right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really a depressing <laughs> diagnosis. Um, uh, I, I think we need to call it what it is. I think we're in, in a major crisis that is far worse than any physical virus. And it's, it's this situation that we're in has just brought it to light, but it's, it's been festering for a good long time. And I think that it's really, it, you know, we have to ask ourselves as individuals, uh, what have we done? I mean, again, I mean, we started this conversation with you telling us what you did. And I think that's really of the whole story because you made like you cared about this youth that you were with and yet a lot of muslims are living adult muslims are living our lives in a real bubble and we have no idea what's happening with the youth we have no idea what's happening with the 95 percent of muslims who don't uh attend the functions that you know take place at masjids even they are just not they don't feel included and what's happening with all of these people and what have we done to take a stance. Um, you know, subhanAllah, we saw people during this whole corona crisis, everybody was taking a stance. Practically everyone was, you know, making statements like stay home and stay home and stay home. Even your average lay person who they don't know anything about medicine or anything, they got involved in this cause. And I think we need to see that kind of effort being galvanized um, for the cause of saving youth from, from a kind of addiction that is unlike any other kind. So I want to talk about that just for a little bit and ask you about that because you mentioned, I think that's beautiful that you talk to your, your, your sons about addiction and, you know, there's addiction, then there's addiction and there's sin and then there's sin and sexual addiction and sexual sin is unlike anything else. Right. It really does warp the fitra and it warps your natural desire to attain to a spiritual closeness to God. It warps it and it can actually destroy it. And that's what we see going on. This is not a joke. It's really a very serious thing to have children as young as 10 and 12 seeing sexual images. This is an attack. It's an attack on what God has given them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us something inside us that's precious. And I mean, I, you and I, maybe you're from my same generation, or maybe I'm older than you by a little bit. But, you know, based on your back to the future comment, maybe we're the same generation. But anyway, you know, subhanAllah, we, I come from a time when there really weren't all, like there was email came in. I remember when I was, when I, started to attend university that was the first email and it was just text-based and so I had a childhood and a teenhood that had none of these images in it and no access to this kind of thing except movies that was it and subhanallah you're you're talking about this ability to the, the you know how difficult it is for teens to um, resist temptation and so on and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also put in teens very powerful energy to, if, if they can get the right 
teachings at the right moment, they also have a very powerful energy to reach heights uh, that, that you cannot reach later on. And this has to be said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the youth who grew up in a state of coming to Allah or being obedient to Allah or being in the, in the service of God. He specified youth. Uh, because there's something that is so unique about that energy that you have. And right now it's really being uh, undermined and directed towards things that are extremely detrimental and extremely damaging for their future. And to me, it's actually appalling that as Muslims, we haven't taken a universal stance to say enough is enough with this stuff, um, including things like TikTok, because I mean, what is the difference between the kinds of things you were describing and pornography? Right. Is there an actual difference? Absolutely. Oh, SubhanAllah, I agree with everything you said uh, and say, uh, you know, uh, you, it, the thing is, as you said, you know, teens, mashallah, they're, uh, you know, part of the seven that are, are guaranteed shade on the day of judgment, those who come right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their youth. So absolutely they're honored. But, but I think people need to understand, and this is why I love talking to teens, because you're right. They, we underestimate their intelligence. They're far more uh, capable than what maybe we think. I think there's this dumbing down element that we have to fess up to, which is not from Islam. It's a very Western thing. You know, this idea that, oh, they're not an adult until they're 18. I don't accept that. I, I definitely don't accept that. I reject that. I think exactly what our dean teaches, which is when they hit puberty, they are adults. Speak to them in that way that you they can rationalize uh, you know information instead of just trying to sugarcoat or shield them you, you know give them the the truth so that they know what to do with that truth so when i talk to teens i let them know very clearly what's going on in terms of the exploitation of their demographic you know teens should know that there is an agenda by the higher ups and we can sit here and it's not conspiracy theory this is just plain capitalism at play you have a system that is you know basically functions on getting as many consumers as possible so they are and we know this from research they target children now forget teens they're, they're targeting our children right the magazines uh, still in the grocery stands why are the most inappropriate foul images placed at eye level for, for young children, right? Uh, the, the home goods and, and housekeeping magazines are up top, but the salacious, scandalous, you know, uh, just tabloid junk is put on the media. Why? Because these people, there's definitely an agenda. There's, there's, there's people who are paid a lot of money to study human behavior, to study, you know, these things and to figure out how to market uh, whatever they're selling to new consumers. And so we're very naive if we think they're not t targeting our children. When you see young children's clothing with highly suggestive sexual messages, like why does a little five-year-old girl, first of all, need to have a bikini? I don't know uh, why she would need to wear a bikini in Target. You know, they have these ridiculous outfits or have on her underwear written something like juicy, the word. Why is that acceptable in our society? Why are we, why do we have these beauty pageant shows that, you know, take these little girls who are innocent and pure in fitra, as you said, some of them are six, seven years old and we dress them up like women and we do hair and makeup and then have them strutting. There was once, I think, I just couldn't believe that this is again, uh, you know, that this wasn't flagged by some child advocacy, you know, group as being highly inappropriate. Uh, you know, these girls who are doing basically uh, pornographic and, you know, routines that you would find, you know, strippers doing uh, for mostly or, you know, mixed audiences, many of which I'm sure, I'm certain are child predators sitting there because this is what they would love to watch. So we have a society that is sick in terms of these things. Mm -hmm. And that we as Muslims have to, like you said, we have to be more ahead of this and we have to have, uh, you know, enough is enough stance. We have to be vocal when we see the threat, not just for our own group. You know, we don't do this, oh, you know, us versus them. This mm -hmm. is humanity. This is, you know, mm -hmm. and so when you see the 
evil, the pervasive evil everywhere around you, and whether it's on an app or in a film or in a cartoon, whatever, we have to st stand up. But unfortunately, we see the opposite. We we see. Uh, I don't know if you uh, you know uh, got wind of anything that um, happened at the Super Bowl halftime show, but it was quite all over the media. Mm -hmm. I wrote a post because I was so disturbed by that performance. Um, I watched it, uh, not all of it, I was honestly disgusted by it, but I, I said, this is so disturbing. I can't believe anybody, nobody you know, stood up for families and children, because children watch football. You know, There's kids all over America, all over the world who are into sports, they like the sport of it. Mm -hmm. So you're you know, putting them in, in uh, you know, this position where they have no idea what's gonna happen. All of a sudden these two women who are in their 40s and 50s basically doing a stripper's routine and we're having shots, you know, the camera angle going directly into their private areas. This is unacceptable, America. The shocking thing was on the comments of my post, many Muslims came to the defense of these artists, as they called them. This was for me like, wow, what have, what's happened in our community? We're clear wrong. You know, we don't even need to sit here and define, you know, lines in terms of religion. You know, this is just human, like, you know, like moral, you know, ethical, you know, uh, wrongs have been committed, but we still try to somehow, you know, we're just kind of, again, I feel like we, we, we've we lost our our side of, 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 of all of this. And, and our children, unfortunately, are the biggest victims because they're following our lead, you know. So this is why I, I think I mentioned it to you or possibly um, Sister Doha, who was with us earlier, that the disturbing thing about TikTok, because that's you know what we're focusing on, is that a lot of times, from what I've witnessed, is that the teens, the Muslim teens that are on there, they are doing inappropriate stuff. I mean, I've seen a lot of highly inappropriate material from visibly Muslim children, teens. They're wearing hijabs, for example. Many young girls are posting pictures of boys that they say are cute, or just referencing uh, having you know crushes or perhaps more than that um, on certain boys and then they'll put images of, of those people up or boys doing the same thing a lot of uh, references about you know gender relations and and flirting and boyfriends and girlfriends and also I've seen uh, just dancing and gyrating and just really like I said seductive um, performances that alone is disturbing but what's also disturbing and this is where I think we need to really speak to the parents here is when the parents are involved in the recordings. You know, you see them in the background, you see them participating, you see them giving license for their kids to do these things. Um, this is to me a big, huge, huge problem because what is that? Is that um, you thinking you're, you know, you're trying to be your child's best friend? Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, that, and that in that endeavor, you forego the role of parent and the role of guide, the role of spiritual teacher, because to allow your child to, you know, um, like, for example, you know, I think uh, I've mentioned it to you. One of the areas that really troubles me is when there's a mockery of religious practice. Uh, you know, and one of our other teachers, you know, she highlighted that today. I'm so glad she did that in one of her posts, mm -hmm. uh, Zainab, because she reminded me that I had seen those same posts of young Muslim teens in prayer outfits or standing up for prayer mm -hmm. with parents in the skit. And the whole point of the skit is to make fun of of the prayer, some component of the prayer. How is that acceptable? How have we lost our way to the Point where we even allow our teens to now make a mockery of our religion and and uh, for likes for to what end right to what end for popularity and we don't see the the incredible danger of doing that because if they don't respect this tradition and they don't respect right the sanctity of this tradition how should we expect them to hold on to it or have any value for it if we're teaching them that it's okay to make a mockery out of it, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, the Billah. It's uh, it's really. I really hope that everybody feels the. You know, I think it, we don't. It's, people might be asking, "Okay, well, what's your what's your solution?" And I really believe that it. You know, the solution starts by, as you said, a broken heart. And I think you said that your heart really breaks for these teenagers. I think that that's where that's where all the solutions come from because the solutions are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are from our Lord. 
our Lord is watching everything. And subhanAllah, he looks for that broken heart. This is what we know from our tradition that Allah is with the one whose heart is broken for his sake. And when your heart breaks for a teenager because they're losing their capacity to connect to Allah, then your heart is breaking for Allah's sake. And you know, so many people, when they've, if they've heard that, that, uh, that, uh, that teaching that Allah, Allah says that I am with the one whose heart is broken for my sake, many people think it's just a personal thing, like, oh, you know, uh, whatever, maybe you, you missed your prayer or something, or maybe you feel like you're not a good enough Muslim and your heart is breaking. But really what you, what you spoke about highlights for me a whole other meaning of that, of that uh, teaching, that it's, you know, your heart breaks for the sake of, of people because you love them for the sake of God. And I believe that anyone listening, that's what I would invite you to do is to really feel the pain. Like it's when I just listening to you, Sister Jose, I feel like I just want to go and just cry in a corner. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really devastating thing. There's no, there's no, um, collected way really to talk about it it's heartbreaking it's devastating it's it's this whole system that is there and alhamdulillah i mean we have we have our lord and i believe that if anyone watching this would just take a moment tonight to really pray and to really beg allah to guide people to save youth from these things wallahi we would see big big changes because this is what's missing, I believe, from our ummah today is people who they have this prophetic concern. And the Prophet Sallallahu he cried for us. He cried for us for these very reasons, for worried that our capacity to connect to Allah would, would, would be diminished and would be compromised. And so you know, I would really encourage people to feel sadness about this as a starting place and to watch then how Allah unfolds for you opportunities to to take the next step in that journey of being the change that you wish to see and that could be that you become inspired perhaps in these days to say listen I want to open a prayer circle for teens the the, the let's say for the daughters of my friends I'm just going to open up a Zoom. We'll get on maybe twice a week and we'll read we'll read like a little bit of the kips together. We'll just recite some things together. You know, you have no idea. That could be that could be a turning point for people. And I just want to mention this because, you know, you talked uh Ustad Jose about how people don't realize how high the stakes are. We don't realize that there are consequences to everything that we do or that we allow to happen, right? If I'm a parent, I'm allowing certain things to happen and I kind of want to downplay that it will really, it's maybe it's not that big a deal, etc. But I want to say that when we've got something like 20 days left till Ramadan and we may be facing a Ramadan where we can't bring our families to the masjid, the stakes are high right now. The stakes are high because if we are developing habits that are all centered around our use of media, social media, then I don't think that we can hope for some kind of instant change uh, the day that Ramadan comes. And it's, it's very close right now. And normally in our, in our mosques and all around, we would be seeing lots of programs that are prepping people for Ramadan. You've got a certain feeling in the air right now. That's, there's no feeling like that. All the feeling is still about the whole epidemic or the whole pandemic. And before we know what Ramadan is going to be there, and we'll maybe I'm worried that certain habits will 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 still be lingering in the air. And it it is going to be upon each and every family to to then deal with the consequences of this. So again, what I'm saying is pray, take a moment if you care about this whole thing to pray tonight and then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the door for you to do something like a prayer circle, which really for, if you could do it even every other day for the next 20 days, that could be everything to someone. And they could be like, you know what? I want that to continue in Ramadan. And who knows, who knows? Great things could come of something like that, you know? 
Mashallah, I love everything you just said because you spoke exactly to the truths of our deen, which is, you know, we have to start with the right intention, which is where that beautiful advice you gave about your heart really has to break, which requires us to know, right? We can't have fight or flight right now. You know, I know a lot of people are, they run when the problems and conflicts are brought up. They get very uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about these things because they want to live in this utopian world that everything's going to be fine. Everything, you know, I'm just going to either focus on right now, but I don't want to think about the possibility that God forbid my child may, uh, you know, have this problem and have that problem. As someone who works with with teens and parents, I can tell you right now that we this is so important for us to focus on. I, I mean, um, I'll tell you, for example, I just recently finished a course at our local masjid on purification of the heart consistently for four weeks, every single, after every single class, there was a mom in the background waiting for me to finish. And they were different all four, all four times. I did seven sessions, but this happened four to- weeks in a row where as soon as the class was over, the mom would come to me. Some of them were complete strangers. I'd never seen them before in my life. And they said, you know, I, I need your help, please. And all of a sudden it was tears and everything was just coming like an overflow, an ambush, like an avalanche of emotion. And what was the issue? My teen daughter, my teen son, they're into vaping, drugs, pornography, uh, violence, being really just away from everything that we want uh, for our children. And the, the consistent theme in all of them was, I did everything. I, I put them in XYZ school, in Sunday school, or they went to full Islamic school. One mother, subhanAllah, she came to me and she was just really devastated. Her son, who was in a HIFS program. He completed his HIFS program. Can you imagine? Yeah, HIFS program is now telling her that he's doubting his faith. Yeah, why? Because if we're not vigilant as parents, and this is why, the, you know, uh, is such an important hadith for everybody to know. The Prophet is telling us we are shepherds, right? We have, we're responsible for our flock. What is a shepherd protecting their flock from? From the wolves that are out there. And yet we seem to think that because we're in the West and we live in the safest cities and we you know, live in gated communities and our children go to the top tier schools and they're you know, taking all these wonderful programs and classes that they that there's no wolves. Where are the wolves? You know, oh, it's just, it's internet. Everybody's on the internet. It's not a big deal. There are wolves everywhere. There are shayateen literally around us all the time, trying to take us away from our Lord. He, we've been warned. This is Adu and Mubin. He will do everything and anything to destroy us spiritually. And if we're not vigilant for our children, and we don't give them the tools to protect themselves with. And then we, on top of that, turn a blind eye to the portal with which the wolves are coming in droves to attack them. What do we expect? Because this is a portal that, as you said, there's so much destruction in, in, in one image. And if we look at the, de- the, the process of the human brain, which is so powerful, right? Most uh, addictions, or especially when it comes to pornography, right? Which is a huge problem in, in, in our world, right? There was a beautiful article that was recently posted. I, I don't have the reference offhand, but hopefully when this is done, maybe we can post it somewhere where this uh, French, um, you know, I think he's a possibly a mental health person, but he just was so compelled to write this article. It's really speaking about the, the dangers of pornography that people just do need to understand about the rewiring of, of the brain, how uh, one image and can lead to, uh, again, this, um, this relenting, nagging feeling of wanting to basically get the next fix, right? Because there's a dopamine a surge that happens when you're looking at something that's igniting that pleasure center in the brain. So if you look at for, for a child, let's say a child who's 11, 12 years old, he, he, you know, he or she are exposed to one image. Let's just say it's an image. It's an inappropriate image. Maybe it's a lady in a bikini or a, a man without a shirt on. But that image is going to, remember, these are the be, uh, beginning years of sexual desire. You know, they, they, before that, before adolescence, kids are so innocent. They don't look at any of the stuff with that thought, but the hormones are surging. Their brains are being rewired. And now, to see an image of a half naked body is going to give them a sensation that they've never had before. And the brain, and of course, Shaitan is right there in his, their ear telling them, you know, look again, look again. And then the next time, 
especially if they have access to a, a web you know, browser, that they know the words. By the time they're in junior high, trust me, if they go to a public school, or even an Islamic school, or just a schooling environment where kids are not really monitored all the time, for sure they're learning these things earlier than people think. And I have stories that would probably uh, bring a lot of people to tears about young middle school students knowing way too much, way too early to the point where I was left stunned. And I've done enough of these coming of age talks with teens where I'm hardly shocked, but I was recently left shocked and stunned and disturbed on levels that I can't even express because I said, this is too young. How could Muslim children already know these terms, right? So we are very naive if we think our kids have never done a search. It's almost, I think it's, I don't know the exact research behind it, but uh, that three letter word especially is, is the most commonly Googled search at all times pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so when you think a child who for the first time has a phone and it has a browser and he has unlimited data, isn't going to do those searches. And trust me, they know how to fool you as parents because there are like online forums and so many sh shared things between teens about how to get rid of clearing cash, how to get rid of your history, how to, people don't even know, for example, what a vault app is. People, you, we should know what a vault app is. They're, they're apps that look like a calculator or a calendar or some innocent little thing, but it's actually a portal into another dimension that allows them to share videos, share pictures, and a parent would have no clue because yeah, yeah. there's, thousands of developers that cater to this demographic. Why? These are the future consumers. They want them to get addicted. Why not? Why not have a, a 12, 13 year old boy who can't help himself? Um, we had, you know, recently, again, we did a, we did a, you know, a, a, a talk with teens. The boys, they knew the website Pornhub, which is one of the most atrocious oh, wow. things in existence. And he knew it. So you think that kid who's already addicted to 12 years old to this website that has an un I, th I don't even know if you can even you know count right how many uh, uh pornographic images and videos that they they host it's just endless but you don't think he's going to be a lifelong consumer for sure you start him at 12 forget it he'll have dysfunction and problems his whole life likely he will have um and i've, I've actually encountered that i've had parents call me and say, my child is gone. The child that I knew and raised up until 14, 15, he's gone. He's now like a zombie. He's lost all like emotion. He's completely just a different person because all he wants to do is spend his entire day in the bedroom. Yeah. So we're, we're just, we need to not turn away from this. And I know it's uncomfortable. We had a question actually uh, that was brought up saying that parents are uncomfortable speaking about these topics. I, I understand that. And as someone who's a teacher and who does these talks, I understand 100% that these are uncomfortable conversations for every parent to have. And I don't think you should have it if you're uncomfortable. What you can do is outsource because it's imperative that you find the mentors in your community, the teachers, right? We have like, mashallah, here we have Anse Shahanaz, who's an invaluable resource for those of you who are in the Senate Collective community. And, you know, people like her or people who've trained under her who understand the spiritual you know, uh, the way that we have to, you know, uh, frame these conversations uh, that you you hand it off to someone like her or someone trained maybe in, again, this area who says, you know what, I will have, you know, I do enough youth work. I, I understand youth. I can I can do this for you. But you need to start early. Don't please don't wait, because I think my the thing that breaks my heart is when I get those, you know, it's kind of like emergency services, you know, someone's coming and it's like everything's kind of already so beyond, not repair, I never want to say that. I never want anybody to get that idea that it's beyond repair. We're not a deen of despair. We don't believe in that. Anything is possible with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's more that it's so critical and it's gotten to a point where it's so difficult that that's when parents seek help. Please don't do that. Don't let you know, your fear, your shyness, uh, you know, blameworthy modesty. This is a disease of the heart. And, you know, we should look into that. But don't let that modesty of, oh, what will people say? What will people think about me and my family prevent you from seeking the help for your child? If you think there's a problem, if you're already seeing 
battles over video games and uh, you know phone at 10, 11. And I've had, I've had parents say, they my kids are throwing tantrums and I don't know what to do. And then they feel that the best thing to do is just give in, but that's actually the worst thing to do. And, you know, I could go on and on about, you know, how that, why that is. But my point is, is please don't wait until it gets so dangerous that now you're really panicking. Cause that's what I, the experiences I've had of too many parents have come up to me in that state. I would rather we put our thinking caps on, be very, very vigilant and say, first of all, I'm not going to give devices. And I, 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 now I'm at a point where I just say that, please. I, I mean, I beg you for the sake of our ummah, for the sake of our future, for the sake of the beautiful, pure hearts of fitra that our children have to please not give your children devices until late into their adolescent years, if they really, really need it. Uh, when they've already done all the emotional intelligence work, hopefully with a qualified teacher, a spiritual guide, who can really help them understand that if they don't practice self-regulation, they are handing their future in, in every which way, professionally, politically, relationship-wise, and the most importantly, spiritually, to the hand, to, to something that will control them. And that's the danger of this. this these, you know, and that's the dangerous, uh, danger of addiction in general, which is why I think we should be having conversations and and you know really normalizing the term addiction because really what it what it means is or what it what it uh, explains is the weakness that we are created uh, you know this is Allah Subhanahu has told us right mm -hmm. that He's made us weak so we should be very open about that that we're all weak and we need strength and if you don't understand uh, how human nature works then you're you're going to you know like uh, like many before unfortunately fall may Allah protect us from that inshallah mm -hmm. yeah I mean I what you're saying is, is so profound and it's so on point and uh yes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created the human being you know in a state of weakness or having this weak side to us yes and I think that um you know it's it's important to acknowledge that and I think that that's, that's exactly why I hate Netflix. And I'm going to say that I really hate it because I, what I feel is, as you're saying, just like those magazines that are placed at the eye level of a child. I mean, this is, this is an attack. This is a, an awareness of people's weakness and a manipulation and taking advantage of people. And as a human being, uh, there's nothing that is more, there's more angering to watch than to see my own fellow human beings being manipulated, being taken advantage of, and being oppressed. This is exactly, you, ha you have to feel a kind of anger inside you that how dare you take advantage of the weak points of human beings. And, you know, subhanAllah, how many students of mine have fallen into a week-long Netflix binge because they had some difficult thing that happened in their life, and then there's Netflix for you available, easy, seemingly comforting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's makes me so angry from inside that how dare you try to replace God for people? Mm. You know, I mean, I've, we've all been through things that are hard in our lives. And I remember I'm, I'm from a time when there was none of that available. Had it been available, that would be me. That's why I'm so, that's why I, I dislike those things so much because I know that I'm looking at myself when I look at people who are stuck in those bad habits. But I, I'm just, I just got lucky that I, it wasn't there for me when I was young. And so I remember when I was 16, I could drive. And I remember whenever I would be really upset about something, I would take the car. I would tell my parents, I want to take the car. And I would go and I would drive 20 minutes to the mosque. And I would just sit there and cry it out. I mean, I, I don't want that to be an experience that's no longer had by 16 year olds. Right, subhanAllah. Why don't they get to have that? I mean, that was life shaping for me, as you're saying, you know, this, you don't give away your power. That's a power, that's a memory that I can always go back to and say, oh, that's how, it, that's how it's done. And I'm worried that people, you know, when you have addictions and Gabor Mate, Dr. Gabor Mate talks about this, that what is an addiction? It's, it's a lack of connection. Mm -hmm. you, you go to it because you want some kind of comfort. And that's where, that's actually where it's all coming from. Of course, there is shaitan, but it's a manipulation of the need, the weakness that we have, which is supposed to be something we bring to God. Yes, I'm weak. And that's why I need you, God. 
I'm so weak, I can't handle this situation. I mean, please, ya qawi, you are the strong and I'm the weak. And it's this thing is coming between us and God. And that's why it, it has to be something that makes our hearts break on the one hand, but also makes our blood boil so that we can do something about it and that we can feel, you know, how dare you? How dare you come between the human being and their Lord? You have no right to do that. When somebody is sad, that's a holy sadness and it has to be taken to God, not taken and numbed by Netflix or alcohol or whatever, or, or pornography, as you're saying. So that, there has to be, I think, that, that attitude. And I think Muslims are very good at being angry about oppression and injustice. And we need to see this as the ultimate injustice, mm -hmm. the, the, the abuse of the human soul and, their, and, 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 and forcing people basically into sin. This is something that we have to be more upset about than any other catastrophe or war or political injustice that we see in the world. This has to really galvanize us. Mm -hmm. um, I agree 100%. And this is what is meant by, right, khutuwat al-shaytan, because it's incremental, their footsteps. He's literally leading us down the rabbit's hole to basically, you know, fall uh, short of everything, right? But it's not so, it's it's subtle, because as we said, you know, we know, alhamdulillah, for the most part, Muslims, you give them alcohol, haram, right? You give them pork, haram. You give them certain things, haram. But what is it about this um, you know, device or these uh, devices that we suddenly start blurring you know, the lines of what's haram and halal. And it's because shaitan, as you said, is exploiting our weaknesses. And this is why it's so important to study the diseases of the heart, to study Imam al-Ghazali's incredible work, Alchemy of Happiness, for example, or her purification of the heart, where he goes into the diseases, right? The, the um, appetites that, that we, are, we have that Allah has given us and the dangers of, of not regulating those appetites because they're all connected, right? And this is why, uh, you know, even now I've done quite a few lives and one of the things I've seen in conversations throughout is people are so in an indulgent state because like you said, it's like we're self-medicating, right? We're, we're in a state of despair. There's uh, uncertainty all around us. We're afraid for our families, our loved ones, ourselves. And instead of taking, like you said, our hearts to our Lord, who's the only one who can change our circumstance, literally, and we know this, uh, we are, uh, instead of doing that, instead of making the most of this incredible windfall of time we've been given, spiritual, you know, time that we've been given to actually lean on him and to get strength from him, people are, again, defaulting to what is normal. And what's normal in our cultures and our societies is to self-medicate, to run from our problems through indulging ourselves with, as you said, food um, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, you know, a diet of, of uh, binging on television or film music uh, which are all of it is just so toxic I mean have we even paid attention to the lyrics I've been to places where I am you know there's music playing and the lyrics are so troubling that this is what uh, is popular music now it's horrible it's horrendous but you'll see you know young Muslim kids jamming away as if it's nothing you know um, we don't realize that all of that leaves an imprint on the spiritual heart, that when we're you know, consuming that kind of toxic stuff, that it's going to affect us and you know, darken the heart that we've been given. Of course it does. And the more and more the heart darkens, then it, it you know, just like when you see those images of people usually uh, you know, indulging in something wrong and inappropriate. They're always in these little dark spaces, right? The bedroom or the bathroom and everything's dark because that's what shaitan wants. He wants you to be in that dark state inwardly and outwardly so that you're hiding in your shame and in your, you know, whatever you're caught up in. And as long as he has his hooks in you that way, then you don't come into the light. You don't stand for prayer. You've, you miss your, your fajr because all night long you were watching X, Y, Z or during the day you're just gorging on food all day long that as i said you're too lazy and lethargic to maybe pray some extra sunnah or you know do some tasbih or read some quran because what happens with the body when we feed it too much? It feels heavy. So people don't make the correlation. And this is why our scholars are brilliant. Like I have these uh, books, subhanAllah, people, I, I think these are so powerful. I'm sure, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've seen these, right? These are the Imam al-Ghazali little chapter books. 
Yes. But like, you know, look, on the treatment of the lust of the stomach and the sexual organs, what would we, how much benefit could, this book is a incredible resource. In these few pages, there's so many gems that give you an inside view in how uh, weak we are in terms of our appetites. But then we have, you know, the harms of the tongue. I have pride and con uh, conceit. Uh, you know, we have power and control. Why aren't we studying these with our children? Why aren't we having honest conversations with our teens that say, listen, you know what? I was like you once. I know how it is. I empathize with you. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you are in a totally different world. Like you said, we're, I'm sure, likely from the same generation. I'm probably older than you. But, um, but uh, you know, we were in a time where we didn't have this attack, visual attack of imagery, um, right, at, at, at every point of our day. We were actually able to exist in a relatively, you know, normal, uh, you know, environment and not uh, have to constantly cover our eyes all the time. Whereas now you could be on, and I've seen it, you know, I'll tell you a story just to show you how demonic these forces are. This was the point where I, and it was probably last year, where I truly was like, I will do the I you know, we just seek refuge with Allah. But I was doing a search for the ayah, hold on to the rope of Allah. And I did a Google image search because I was looking for a really beautiful image of Arabic calligraphy with this ayah. My heart, um, and I don't want to get emotional right now, but it to me was like, this is what we're up against. This, uh, in, in, in a search for a verse of the Quran, I was looking through the scroll and at the bottom, these de demons had a pornographic image of a woman in tied up in ropes. Just because I did a Google search of rope, do you see how, and I have all the safety features on my you know, browsers. So I was like, how did, how did this come onto my browser? She is a, it was like a, from a film possibly. I don't know what it was. I didn't even look. I just saw it and I was like, oh my God, this kind of came up on a Google search for an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. This is why we cannot be naive as parents and think that our kids will be fine because all their friends have it and, and, and what have you. No, it's too dangerous. Let them grow up in innocence and keep their fitra as long as possible. Even if they're, it doesn't matter if they are 15 and 16 and don't know really much about anything, it's okay. You know, I don't know why parents feel they need to rush their children into adulthood. They're going to have decades of responsibility and, you know, all of these problems to deal with. They're inheriting a very toxic world that we've left them. Can we let them enjoy their childhood, please? Like, let them enjoy the innocence of daydreaming about unicorns and butterflies. Why do they need to see, you know, this just toxic world that invites uh, curiosity that is untamable? And that's the danger, is that we, we, we are, we're, I think we've just lost sight of the way that, you know, this, uh, that who's behind all of this, how do they, why do they do what they do? And the fact that our children uh, deserve, you know, for us to protect them and not to just turn away because we're too distracted with our world and our problems. And it's a nice babysitter, you know, it's okay, just go play on your video or your iPad, uh, you know, while I take this phone call or while I cook dinner. No, no, and no, please give them something more useful because that one 20, 30 minute interaction could be the beginning of a really, really dangerous thing for your family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. And I, again, I feel bad because I don't want people to leave feeling helpless and just miserable um, <laughs> from this conversation. But I do think it's important, as uh, Anse Shahnaz mentioned, that we bring this out and talk about it openly because the naivete is really the, the problem, you know, is that, that there's a and there's, you know, and I know parents, of course, we all love our children. We want nothing but the best for them. So this is no blaming and shaming. It's just rather, I think we sometimes, um, we're just not aware that the demonic forces are so strong. Uh, they're everywhere and they're gunning for our children, uh, you know, and may Allah protect them. But we have to be vigilant. I mean, uh, there's a question here, Ustada Jose, about some um, successful strategies and i would i would say either you can let's take the question or maybe we do a follow-up session I'll, I'll put that to you 
Uh, I would be honored to do anything with you. This was <laughs> such an honor to, to meet you and see you for the first time. So I'm just letting you know, I'm at your service. You let me know what you want from me. I will do anything. It's my <laughs> honor. I, I think that you have, I mean, you, you're a wealth of resources and I would love actually to do a whole session um, you know, you don't need me on it, actually, but, oh, uh, cool. <laughs> you know, you, you know, I think it would be great for all of us to hear what are the strategies as, as the sister is asking, what are the techniques you use? And also what are some resources that people could read about? Like they could use, you mentioned the article about the effects of pornography. Yes. Um, there are all kinds of things that we can equip ourselves with. I think, I think I, we really hear your call to, get involved and stop turning a blind eye. So there are a lot of things we need to equip ourselves with as uh, adults at this point, including this art that I heard you referring to and you didn't go further, but I would love to see you talk about um, holding your ground when your child is insisting that everybody else has that. And you know, I see so many parents and I sympathize with them they're tired and they've got stuff to do and they don't have the, you know, the bandwidth, as they say, to, to tolerate a big tantrum or if it's a teen, uh, to tolerate a week of being your, your teen being rude to you and passive aggressive because you didn't let them do something or didn't let them access some, some, some platform or something. I think it would be so helpful if we would, if you could give a, a talk about that and just empower um, adults to feel okay about their children being displeased with them. Because I think the tables have unfortunately really turned where we are worried about, are our children happy with us? And that was never the case. The, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us, make sure your parents are pleased with you. You're looking, not <laughs> And it's completely oh, flipped. I see, I see, Almost all the parents in my generation are just worried about, oh, but my child will be so upset if I do that. Oh, my child, I, I want my child to be happy. And mm. what is happiness, first of all? And, and so many questions there. So I'm, I'm just putting this to you that perhaps we can uh, have another online session. And, and I would love, I really would. I, would. I would be so honored to do, as I said, anything with you at all. And especially on this topic, as you, as I explained to you, I'm very, very passionate about certain topics anything related to protecting uh, uh, children, excuse me, or teens from all of these pitfalls and dangers and, you know, just traps of shaitan uh, to help fortify them spiritually. I'm always on board for it. It's a bulk of what I do in terms of my work with youth. Uh, so I love doing that parenting advice and, you know, really talking about effective tools and strategies. I'm happy to do all of that as well as really giving people the toolkits uh, like like emotional intelligence, which I referred to earlier, because that is to me a real starting ground. If you want to really get ahead, uh, especially for parents with small children, because sometimes people think these conversations have to be had later, but no, you you start the the planting, you know, and and the tilling of the soil early, and then you you plant the seeds, you know, when when the soil is right. But you don't just you know wait, neglect the soil, and then start planting when it's dry, and you know you don't do that. And I think. Uh, that's where, you know, getting ahead of, of the conversation, becoming very well versed in child development and understanding children's brains, how they function, understanding what tailored parenting is, which is I've done parenting workshops specifically about tailoring parenting, because I think this one size fits all model mm -hmm. is also very dangerous because it's convenient. It's easy. I just have general rules for all four or five kids in the house. Everybody has to follow it. And it, we kind of just, you know, basically do like a drill sergeant, you know, everybody falls in line and that's how the house is run. This is not effective. The problem is I said, which is why I love emotional intelligence, because the whole component of emotional intelligence is empathy. There is no human being who is more empathic ever than the prophet I said, he mm -hmm. was empathic as an infant. People forget as a nursing infant, he did not drink milk until his milk brother was full. Mm -hmm. What does that teach us about the value of empathy? So if we don't look at our children as individuals and we just think of them as little minions that just run our errands for us and that's all we see in them and we you know speak down to them and not honor them and you know someone said to me something that was so beautiful they said we forget that these that children are you know their souls 
are are eternal and they're that's still inside of that child you know the soul mm, I love and, and you know so why do we treat them like they're just these you know little you know unintelligent you know they don't get it and you see people speak that way whether they do it in that diminishing very uh, insulting sort of tone or they do it in the oh uh, you know i'll explain it to you later it's the same thing mm-hmm. stop because your children deserve to know the truth in portions that are appropriate you do it correctly but you don't lie to your children you don't you know that i think people just resort to i mean anyway i'm sorry i could go on and on i'm going to stop because I kind of uh, get carried away emotionally, but I, as I said, I'm honored to do anything with you. You let me know date and time. I will make myself available for you. You're very busy. You have so much to do. So just let me fit into your schedule, but I would be honored, truly. Uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So thank you. Alhamdulillah. I, uh, I think um, we got a message that some of the parents are expressing a lot of guilt and helplessness. Um, yeah, well, I would say to you, it, what I would say to you is I think that Guilt is, um, I, maybe, and I'll just end with this and then Usada Hussein, you can take it from there. Um, but guilt is a, uh, an emotion, I think, that paralyzes us. Mm-hmm. Whereas shame and regret and remorse are very important things. Especially if what you mean by guilt is a sense of regret that I wish I had been aware of this earlier, I wish I had done better. Because regret is the very essence of Tawbah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Tawbah is regret. A Tawbah, nadam, nadam, a Tawbah. That's what it is. You can't, um, we can't try to avoid the discomfort of that feeling. That feeling is what brings us again to the door of God. And I think it's okay to sit in that place for a little bit and say, yeah, wh- what am I doing? And out of that grows so much, so much determination. At the beginning, it feels like you're, just thrown to the ground, right? When you first feel that feeling like, oh my God, I've been letting my kids use these devices or, oh my God, I've been so involved in my own life that I haven't realized that I have a lot of responsibility. I get it. Um, and But when you're thrown to the ground, reach for God, it'll come. Don't try to rush past that because again it's like that broken heart Allah sees that Allah is with you and when you let yourself as uncomfortable as that feeling is when you let yourself be washed by that you find that the next day you're full of determination to go at it and make and make changes and uh, so it's okay to feel that way and it's, it's not something I want to comfort you out of because I think that we are in a very we are in a very dangerous position if we don't feel that way then there's something wrong with us so feel that way and feel like, oh my God, what are we going to do? We're in the middle of the situation. I've already got kids who are 13 and I don't know what's going on with them. Bismillah, cry out to God in that situation. And helplessness, again, yeah, we're all helpless. We are. We're, we're unbelievably helpless. We don't acknowledge it. We are so helpless. Allah is our only help. We call, we say, ya Allah, ya darikil halikin. This is something that we see the the, the people who are close to Allah, they have this beautiful way of talking to Allah that, that you know, shows us whole dimensions that we didn't even understand that could be possible in a relationship with Allah. And it's one of the things that our pious predecessors say is, they, they refer to God as, Oh, you who saves the people who are destroyed. Mm-hmm. Who are they referring to? They're not talking about over there. They mean themselves. Ya Allah, halikin. you are the one who can save me. I'm destroyed if not for you. I see myself right now, I'm heading towards destruction. Ya Allah, grab me and save me. And I let us do that in these days. This is Shaban, this is a month that we're right before Ramadan. Let us have some nights that are like that. Let us have some tears that are like that. And, you know, subhanAllah, they say about April, what do they say? April showers bring May flowers. Well, Shaban showers bring Ramadan flowers. Mm-hmm. Let yourself cry those tears. You will see beauty come. So that's what I would say to you that we should feel that way right now. I feel that way. I feel that way. I don't have children. And I feel, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, if you don't help us, how, what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. You know, and yes, I want the Jose to give us the strategies and I know that they're going to help. But I, I want to stop here because I want us to take that time to really 
beg Allah. We have a tendency in our in our day and age to jump to the solution. Hmm. Everything is about that, you know, and it's also part of our, it's the culture that's been created for us by online. Because back in the day, if I had to figure out how to take a stain out of something, if I had to figure mm -hmm. out anything, I couldn't just go online. Now I can go online for anything at all and find the solution. Yes. Even for mental health problems, you, you can diagnose yourself, you can diagnose your partner, you can decide that your mother is a narcissist based on a checklist. I mean, everything is just, let's get to it, let's get to it. Whereas there's no space given to, oh, okay, this is a situation. Let me ask Allah for help. I don't know what the solution is. I don't actually know. I'm not sure. All I know is I got a problem and that Allah sees me and Allah can help me. Allah, Allah, that was so beautiful. I said it. I mean, Ansi Shanas, I really don't have much to add to that. It was um, beautifully put and I, I agree with everything. I don't want anybody to walk away feeling in despair. Despair is the station of shaitan. We are not a, an ummah of despair. We always have hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do anything. And that's why we have stories like, you know, uh, Prophet Yunus alayhi What did he do when he was in the belly of the, the whale, right? Trapped in darkness, but immediately he recognized, you know, his mistake and he turned to Allah and Allah freed him. He gave him, uh, he answered his du'a. So the power of du'a cannot be overestimated. The power of reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like you said, the healing oftentimes is in the process. So allow yourselves to sit with with these feelings for a little bit to reflect on them as you as uh, Anse said not to rush through the process and look for quick you know fixes this is not a quick fix situation this is a, i have to uproot the situation fix and uprooting requires uh, some thought some planning some work uh, and inshallah in for in future um you know uh, conversations with our beloved Anse we will be able to give you more solutions and hopefully we could do that soon i as i said i will make myself available to you because i want to give people some hope and not you know uh oh i'm going to be left um you know, to, to myself with all these thoughts for, for weeks on end. You know, I, I'm, I'm uh, making myself available really within the next few days, week, however long you need Anse, just let me know. Mm -hmm. And we can do a part two right away that really is more solution oriented. Yes, and that yeah. way, everybody who's been uh, with us, may Allah bless all of you. May Allah bless your children, your home. Don't lose hope. Everything, inshallah, we can turn things around and we can uh, give you the tools that you need to really uh, start creating the, the homes of balance that, that we should all wish for. And mm -hmm. at the center of that is everything that Ansi has been talking about, which is our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we don't start there and we try to read this book or that book or follow this, it's, it's going to fall apart. We have to realign ourselves with, with him first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then from there we can grow, inshallah. So mm -hmm. for uh, your time. I'm sorry, I, I realize I have to pray Asr, so I need to yeah. leave. Uh, mm -hmm. I hate to rush it, but I, I'm, no, you know, I, I'm so I'm so grateful to you. And I want to say to everyone, Bismillah, let's aim for I'm I'm good for Tuesday if you want to do Tuesday. Um, we're gonna ask everyone who's watching this, make sure you round up your friends. <laughs> so that we have an even bigger uh, community of people who are praying uh, about this and, and inshallah aware and uh, you know we'll call it an awareness campaign bismillah why not and so, so bring all your your parent friends your teacher friends and let's inshallah gather with a beautiful intention uh tuesday bismillah we'll get out the information to you as soon as we can and uh let's do this inshallah bihawlillah by the by the help and the power of our Lord, inshallah. Amen, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Jazakallah khair. Please, can, can you end in dua so that we can part, inshallah, with your barakah? With your barakah. Barakallah fikum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Oh Allah, we ask that you would guide uh, everyone who is listening to this, Ya Allah. We ask that you would guide all our teachers and all those who are striving to benefit uh, the ummah, to benefit all of humanity with goodness, with pathways to come back to you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask that you would that you would increase the brokenness of our hearts towards you, Ya Allah. For you have said that well, you are with every broken heart that is broken for your sake, Ya Allah. We ask that you would grant us that holy station of having a heart that's broken for your sake. For that is the station that you showed us your Prophet وسلم, has. Ya Allah, we ask that we would remain in that place of caring deeply for the well-being not only of our own children, but of the children of all of humanity. 
whether whether it is Badr or Brad, whoever it is who's who's lost in a sea of, of filth, Ya Rabbi, we ask that we would beg you on this night to liberate them from the chains of that darkness, Ya Allah. And we know that you are the one who hears prayers, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask that we would dedicate the best of our prayers to praying for all of humanity and especially the children and the youth to be liberated from the chains that are holding them, Ya Allah, away from you, Ya Allah, and we trust you, and we know that you are the one who is near, and you are the one who hears. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa ashraf al-Nabi wa alihi, to the honor of the Prophet Sallallahu and his family, Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki yawm al-Din, Iyaka na'abudu wa Iyaka nasta'een, اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بارك الله فيكم جزاكم الله خيرا إن شاء الله